lions, giants, and bears, trusting God in times of fear. This is week four. My name is Cassie Waits, and I'm so glad that you're part of our class today. In the shadow of COVID-19, we are being plagued by a second virus, a virus we call fear. And while some fear is healthy, all too often fear overwhelms us, overtakes us, and crowds out the abundant joy that life in Christ offers. In this series, we are reflecting on fear, how scripture speaks to fear and the powerful reassurances that God offers us in these times. Last week, we looked at relational fears, the fear of failure, the fear of rejection. And what we saw is that scripture assures us that who we are is not determined by the world around us, but by who God says we are. And God calls us beloved children. This week, we turn our attention to existential fears, the fear that life, nothing in life matters, that we're purposeless, that everything is insignificant. And again, we will see that scripture is uniquely equipped to help us face these fears because it is in scripture that we encounter the living God. We're going to take two examples, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. We're going to read stories about people who are in an existential crisis, and we will find in both cases that what moves them through that crisis is nothing short of an encounter with God. So grab your Bibles and let's get started. As we begin our time together, let's open with a word of prayer. Let us pray. God of all wisdom, thank you for this day and this chance to gather, to study your word and apply it to our lives. We pray that your spirit would move through us, opening our hearts and minds to hear the message you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. When it comes to existential fear, one biblical story stands out. One story digs deep into these fears and gives us a front row seat to what it means to struggle with this fear of, does any of this matter? And that story is the story of Job. Now, we tend to think of the story of Job as a story about theodicy. Theodicy seeks to answer the question, if God is all good and God is all powerful, then why does evil exist? And certainly Job is concerned with these questions. But underneath the conversation around God's justice and good and evil, what we find is a deeper question, which is, does any of this have a purpose? Is what is happening to Job for a reason? or not. Let's remember the basics of Job's story by reading the very beginning of the book. This is Job chapter 1 verses 1 through 12. Let's read together. There once was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold feasts in one another's houses in turn, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the feast days had run their course, Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This is what Job always did. One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it? The Lord answered Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a fence around him and his house and all that he has on every side? 
You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand now, and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well. All that he has is in your power. Only do not stretch out your hand against him. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. There are some theological concerns we might have as we read this opening to the book of Job. First of all, Job's faithfulness seems to be rewarded by his great number of possessions. Secondly, God makes a deal with the devil here. Let's set those difficult complications aside for a minute, though, and focus in on verse 9, which I think is really important. We read this. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? This question is a question that, that drives the entire book of Job. And I, I think this question is, is just a small part of a bigger question, which is this. Is all of this for nothing? Is our suffering for nothing? Are our, our joys for nothing? Is all of life random or is there some kind of purpose to it? That's a big question. That's an existential question. And that's a question that's just under the water throughout the book of Job. After this introduction, Job's life gets very, very bad. And in quick succession, he loses his health, his wealth, and his 10 children. Job does not face this tragedy alone, though. He has friends, and they come to him, and they sit with him and support him during this crisis. Let's see how much you remember about Job and his friends. It's time for a pop quiz. What are the names of Job's friends? A. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. B. James, John, Peter, and Andrew or C, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, and Elihu. If you answered C, you would be correct. Job's friends are Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, and Elihu. Now, if you answered A, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I invite you to watch last week's Sunday School Online where we learned about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were the friends of Daniel. We read about them in the book of Daniel. If you answered B, James, John, Peter, and Andrew, you are referring to the friends of Jesus in the New Testament. Um, those are the names of some of Jesus' disciples. But Job's friends are answer C. You might not remember the names of Job's friends, but you probably know that they get a lot of grief for the advice and encouragement that they offer him. They get ridiculed for being insensitive to Job during his time of crisis. And I want to suggest that we might have been too quick to judge these friends. Because as I read the suggestions they make, I think they might be sincerely trying to support Job. I think they're offering the very best wisdom they have to help him through this dark time. And so they make these suggestions. They say, look, Job, uh, you should confess your sin to God. Make, make that relationship with God right again. They say, Job, maybe you should just start praying. Just really get into the habit of some spiritual practices, again, that will ground you and that will connect you back to God, because it seems that that relationship between Job and God is being torn. And finally, they suggest maybe, Job, maybe this is a learning experience. Maybe God is preparing you for something down the road. And this is not terrible advice. It's not terrible advice to say, hey, when you are in a crisis, maybe this is a moment to step back and to try to reconnect with God, to reconnect, um, to reconnect that relationship. Maybe this is a time to, to th think about what does this experience mean and how, how might it be preparing me for something in the future? 
The thing is, all of these friends' advice are trying to give meaning to Job's experience. But that meaning is just not sufficient. Job and his friends go round and round in their dialogue for 35 chapters. And eventually their conversation unravels. They simply cannot reason their way to explaining Job's suffering. And then in chapter 38, God shows up. And this is what we read. Job 38, 1 through 11. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors and said, Thus far you shall come and no further, and here shall your proud waves be stopped. In response to Job's demand that God provide some explanation for his suffering, God shows up and never explicitly answers the question. Uh, in fact, God says, you don't ask me questions, Job. I will ask you the questions. And then God goes on to talk about all the wonderful things God has created since the beginning of the world. God's response to Job is shocking because God never once mentions Job in it. God doesn't ever explicitly answer the question, why has Job suffered so much? And yet, at the end of these divine speeches, they end uh, in chapter 41, we read that Job is silenced. And I think Job is silenced, Job's questions dry up because Job is satisfied. It wasn't the good, well-meaning reasoning and encouragement and advice from Job's friends that satisfies Job's need to know that it's not all for nothing. It's only the very presence of God that can satisfy what Job needs. And it's in that theophany, despite the fact that God never really explains things, it's the presence of God that seems to make the difference for Job. And maybe it's the presence of God in our lives that enables us to move through our existential fears and into new life, just as Job does. Take a minute and reflect on this question. When has God shown up for you and enabled you to move into new life? Job is not the only person in scripture to wrestle with existential fear. In Max Lucado's 2009 book, Fearless, he notices that the disciples wrestle with this kind of fear after Jesus is crucified and buried, but before they realize he has been resurrected. And so Lucado goes to Luke chapter 24 as an example of disciples in an existential crisis and how an encounter with God turns that fear around. Let's read Luke 24 together. Luke 24, 13 to 32. Now on that same day, that is the day of the resurrection, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? 
who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? Jesus asked them, What things? And they replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road? while he was opening the scriptures to us. Reflecting on this story, Max Licata goes on to ask, why does Jesus himself show up to these disciples? Wouldn't it have been easier to just send an angel or a trusted messenger instead? But no, we see Jesus taking the time and the energy, not just to show up, but to walk seven miles with these disciples. But it seems like it was important that Jesus be there in person. And Max Lucado concludes, and I think I tend to agree with this, concludes that when it comes to this kind of existential crisis, this question of, is this all for nothing? Have we lost all hope? Is, there, is, is everything that we've worked for, was it just, was it, was it not real? We, when we have these kinds of questions, Lucado says, the only thing that will satisfy, the only thing that will move us through that fear and through that crisis is the very presence of God. So the question for us is, how do we touch the body of Christ today? I like the suggestion of Max Licato in his book, Fearless. He says that we touch the body of Christ when we are in fellowship with a community of faith, and when we are studying scripture. So today, if you are in fellowship, no matter what that might look like for you, or if you are studying scripture and engaging in Bible study, again, that may look a little different than it has in the past, but when you are doing those things, you are in fact touching the body of Christ, you are putting yourself in the presence of God. And it's those encounters with God that we see through scripture help push back against these existential fears. If Max Lucado is right that we encounter God in scripture and fellowship, then how might you encounter God this next week?